see this process where this material is thrown into the air then and the, uh, it moves downwind just like it would if it were particles of sediment in the stream. Here you can see that taking place. This picture isn't out of focus. What you're seeing is you're looking through all the sediment, all the dirt, the dust in the air that's blowing around. Here you've got a picture from the 1930s from the Dust Bowl. As the 1900s opened up the west, all of a sudden the prairie sod was being broken, farming was taking place, and in 1929 the stock market crashed. There was very little money to lend farmers to put seed into the ground, and most of the fields in the Midwest lay fallow that year. They had been plowed, they had been harvested, but they were just sitting there bare, and they never got replanted. And it also began this uh, cycle of drought. <coughs> and those two things combined meant for the next 10 years or so, the Great Plains went through these horrible dust storms uh, every year where uh, the air just literally turned black with dirt, and buildings would be buried in a single episode. It was a very devastating time. A lot of research was done, a lot of agricultural uh, planning was done. Uh, things that we take uh, for granted today as far as the way we do farming uh, were really developed to combat these Dust Bowl um, era uh, problems. So we see the wind being able to pick up the fine material, but it's going to leave the coarser material behind, isn't it? It, it takes more energy to pick up the heavy stuff. So what we see is the winds kind of stripping the fine stuff out of the landscape, leaving the, the coarser material behind. And what we see oftentimes is the surface that looks like this. It almost looks like they came out with a a bulldozer and push some gravel around and then ran a, a roller over it and it almost looks like a compacted gravel road. And this is what we call desert pavement. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It armors the surface. The fine material in between the bigger grains is blown out. The bigger grains clink together, lock together, and over time settle into a basically a layer on the surface that then armors the surface from losing any more fine material. It's sitting on top of the regular material. So the pavement uh, actually does look like it's man in place, uh, but it's all natural. All of that sand, all that fine material that's blowing around in the wind, that's pretty lethal stuff. Now, Obviously, if you're breathing it in, that's not good for you. But, I mean, you're all familiar with the process of sandblasting, right? you got a rusty car fender, you take it into the shop, and they shoot sand at it with a compressor and air, and it takes all the rust off down to shiny metal. Well, the same thing's happening here, and it's nature. All that fine material blowing around in the wind, when it impacts something, it's going to leave a little scratch, a little chip. And basically, it's going to eat away at exposed rock surfaces. And now we end up with a flat surface, a facet on that rock, where it's basically been sandblasted flat. As the rock rolls over into a new position, a new surface gets sandblasted onto it. And here you can see a rock with a number of these facets, depending on what position it was in. This ends up producing something called a ventifact. And ventifacts are just these faceted rocks, just sandpaper, just sandblasted off uh, with these flat surfaces. As all this material, this finer material, is stripped out of the area, only the more resistant stuff's going to get left behind. And here's a case, this is from the White Desert in Egypt. And you can see this used to be the, the level of the landscape. And all of this material here is now missing. It's all been blown away. This is the more durable material. It's better cemented. And you get these kind of cool mushroom things where the less cemented material underneath is getting blasted away. 
and eventually this stem of remaining material is going to go, this rock is going to collapse onto the ground. But you go drive out through parts of the white desert and all you see are these big, giant mushrooms all over the place. And they, these are called yard eggs. It's really pretty impressive. One of the things that really helps to stabilize this, this sediment of this soil is vegetation. Just like when we talked about uh, weathering and erosion, remember how we talked about the root system of vegetation, how it helps lock the soil together? Well, same thing here. Out in the desert where we have vegetation, we see the soil being held in place. See them blowing through the, the stalks of grass, that drops the velocity, it creates turbulence, it allows the sediments to drop out of the airstream. So we see not only does it lock sediment into place, but it also creates kind of a buildup of sediment there as it kind of drops the velocity and allows the sediment to settle. And it means water is probably going to need to be around if we're going to have any kind of vegetation, vegetation growing in the area. Here you can see an area it's a sand-rich area, covered with grass, but look what's happened here. For some reason, that grass has been broken, that grass surface has been compromised. Whether it was uh, cattle out there grazing, uh, whether uh, it were uh, people hiking or out there with, with RVs or whatever, the surface was broken and the underlying sand was exposed. And now, the wind can really start picking at it. And we start to see that this area now becomes susceptible to erosion. You can see how it's kind of already started. And we get something like this, it's called a blowout. And they also are known as deflation hollows. And it's simply an area where once they get started, they can really kind of take off. The wind can get to it and it undermines the grass around the edges and that collapses and, and the process kind of continues. I think when we think in terms of deserts, we think mostly in terms of these big sandy, dry areas with sand dunes. And that is kind of a common, common viewpoint. But I can look at these sand dunes and I can tell you a lot about what's going on in that desert because there are different types of dunes that form under different conditions. For instance, this is a type of dune called a barkan, B-A-R-C-H-A-N. This is a, kind of a crescent-shaped dune and it forms originally so it is transverse to the direction of wind. In other words, it's across the wind direction, 90 degrees to the wind direction. And as the wind blows the sand off the face and redeposits it on the lee side on the back, and turbulence moves some of the sand, basically this whole dune is moving from left to right. It's moving downwind. But at the end of the dune, there isn't much sand. It's kind of just a hill. So the end of the dune where there's less sand, that end moves faster than the middle where the sand is the thickest. So the overall effect now is this dune starts to take on this crescent shape as the ends migrate downwind faster than the center. So this tells me a lot of information. One, it gives me the wind direction because I know for these horns to be blown downwind, the wind has to be moving, in this case, from left to right. It also tells me there's only a moderate amount of sand available out in the desert. If there were more sand, I wouldn't have these low little ends to these, these mounds. They'd be continuous ridges. If there was less sand, there wouldn't be much to blow around, and I wouldn't have any dunes for me. So Barkins tell me wind direction, and they also tell me the supply of sand is somewhat limited. It's a moderate amount of sand. If I had more sand out there, I'd get something called a transverse dune. 
Now instead of just a mound where the ends can blow down forming horns, I've got a ridge that is continuous extending all along at 90 degrees to the wind direction. And that's what I see here. And notice I have a gentle upwind side and a steep downwind or lee slope. And again, the upwind side, the material is moving over <coughs> and being deposited down in back of the, the dune on the lee side. So these are all moving downwind as they migrate. You can see that in this picture here. You can see the gentle upwind side, you can see the steep lee side. So that we know here in Death Valley the wind is blowing in that picture from right to left. And you know, there's more sand than you know, the situation where you get barcodes. Here's a picture from Mars. You just don't get sand dunes on Earth, but you get them any place you have sand and wind. And Mars is one of those places. Larkins, you can see them all developed here. So you know that the wind is blowing from right to left. But look at what's happening when you get over here. You're getting transverse dunes. And in between, you're getting Barkins that are kind of semi-hooking together to make transverse dunes. It's kind of this transitional form between the two. So you know sand supply is increasing from right to left. These are what they call barkanoid dunes, because they're partly barkin, they're partly transverse, so they're kind of this transitional phase. So you can see the wind in the way it's blowing. Another type of dune that you get starts with a blowout or a deflation hollow. And you can see that here. Notice we've got some water here, so we're pretty close to the water table, aren't we? and we're getting a little bit of vegetation. Normally the blowout occurs in an area where there isn't any vegetation. It starts as one of these deflation hollows here. But the vegetation will anchor the soil in place along kind of the ends around the deflation hollow. So what we see now is the sand that's being blown out of the deflation hollow or the blowout is accumulating on the back side as a pile of sand. So here I've got wind that's blowing from right to left again. Notice I'm getting the same kind of form that I got with the bark and dune, but now the wind direction is just the opposite. This is uh, a, what they call a parabolic dune, and this is easily confused with barkins. So here what you look for is you look for this kind of hollow here, this deflation hollow in between the horns. That's telling you it's a parabolic, and that's where the sand supply is coming from, and the wind's blowing it out of that area downwind. So you can tell just the opposite of what a barkin is. So here we're looking at even less sand than we would with a barkin dune system. Here, it's just the limited sand supply of the blowout itself. I'm seeing the waves up there. Um, are you more likely to find a parabolic dune near like, the beach? Yeah, these often form near beaches because you need vegetation, and vegetation needs water. So beaches are very, very typical areas for these kinds of support. Good, good observation. OK. so. Here you can see some parabolic dunes, and in this case, uh, notice here's our deflation hollow, here's the dune, and in this case the wind is moving from left to right. Sometimes you get dunes that instead of being transverse to the, the wind direction, they parallel the wind direction. And here you get these big, long dunes. And what looked like highlights, that's simply the sunlight uh, shining on one side of the dune. And these dunes are parallel to the wind direction. Now, what that's telling you is that the wind direction isn't constant. It's primarily parallel to the ridge, but it's shifting side to side. So any sand that might be kind of forming transverse to the direction gets swept back in 
and blown back into this main ridge that parallels the wind direction. So these are big, huge longitudinal dunes. And um, sometimes they've been called scythe dunes. Uh, that basically is when they're exceptionally straight and very regular in their spacing. I mean, they're kind of an extreme. And, and, a, and a scythe is uh, basically uh, an Arabian knife. And that's why they call them. Or another type of dune pattern you can run into is what we call a star dune. Because that's just what it looks like. It looks like this star, kind of this multi-ridged uh, star, kind of like a big starfish just sitting there made out of sand. And this is telling me the wind is always changing direction. This is an area where it just can't make up its mind. It starts making a dune, the wind shifts, it starts making another dune in another direction. And it's just back and forth, making these big, long, sinuous ridges. Normally, in this case now, we've got quite a bit of sand, because we can make all these different ridges, and the sand keeps getting blown around. We do get water in a desert. Not much. Remember, it was less than a couple inches a year. But normally, when we do get water in the desert, it comes all at once. You see these just massive thunderstorms that kind of go ripping through the area. They don't last long, but they put down a lot of water all at once. Here's a, a thunderstorm in Tucson, Arizona. And you can just see this huge anvil head thunderstorm. And notice it's, it's really pretty limited in its scope. But look at the rainfall that is coming out of this thing. So a stream that would normally be dry most of the time, simply not enough water, after one of these storms, that water's a raging torrent. The water simply can't soak in fast enough, and we see these flash flooding events taking place. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit from thinking in terms of these depositional sand basins and deserts. Let's think in terms of erosion. All that sand's got to come from somewhere, right? So we're eroding some bedrock somewhere. And one of the most common ways of setting one of these up is to make a horse and robin topography, the southwest part of the United States, right? So we have our two normal downthrown faults here, made a valley, and now we start to see erosion occurring along this plateau area, and that sets up a flash flooding type of stream building a fan, alluvial fan, out into that downthrown valley. If I keep building up these fans as erosion continues to cut into the, the plateau, these fans are all going to start to coalesce, just kind of grow into one another. And as they do that, I'm going to develop what we call a bahada. And a bahada is simply a fancy name for kind of a big apron all along the valley wall that's fed from a number of these, these streams. Occasionally, when I have these big thunderstorms, the fans grow rapidly as the water discharges out of the canyons and flash flood. And any water that hasn't already soaked into the ground accumulates down here in the valley, forming a lake. But these lakes are pretty temporary. A lot of that water soaks into the ground pretty fast, and it evaporates pretty fast. So these are what we call plyo lakes. And these will last maybe a few days, a few weeks, maybe a couple months. But generally, they're pretty temporary. Very, what we call ephemeral. Most of them, as they sit there, the real fine-grained material settles out. So that part of the basin now gets coated with clay. And that clay helps seal that surface and helps to uh, keep the next accumulation of water from just soaking into the, into the sediment. So once they kind of get started and the clay forms a seal, uh, they tend to be a little longer lasting. 
but eventually I'm going to 